Welcome everyone. So glad you are here. Looks like people are filing in. It's so good to have you here. I'm Jillian Castor, Community and Advocacy Manager. I'm just going to give us a minute to get started. So I can see this number growing very fast. Welcome everyone. So glad you're here. This is day one of our webinar series, Dyslexia Awareness, Bridging Research with Real wor World Support. I'm so happy you are all here. I'm Jillian Castor, your Community and Advocacy Manager. Today, as we get going, if you have questions for our hosts, Danelle Pons and Kristen Killian, we'd love if you would put them in the Q&A sec section. Awesome. It looks like we already have people commenting in the chat too that just the hosts and panelists can see this. So we will um, be sharing out your questions. So please put them in the Q&A as we go on today. I'm going to quickly introduce our presenters. We have Donnell Pons, who is a dyslexic specialist, educator, presenter, and writer who now works with adults with reading challenges. And she is the president of the IDA Utah chapter. Also joining us today, we have Kristen Killian, who is the Metro RISA Dyslexia Endorsement Co-Coordinator and serves as an endorsement instructor. She teaches literacy courses in the undergraduate and graduate programs at Kennesaw State University in the Department of Elementary and Special Education. And Kristen serves as an expert literacy analysis or analyst, sorry, for the National Council of Teacher Quality and is certified P12 reading specialist. So we can go to the next slide here, just so you can see that we are in part one of a two-part series. And I will turn it over to you, Donnell. Thanks, everyone. Great. Thank you, Jillian and Kristen. I'm so excited to present with you. This is going to be a fun conversation. And we're so excited to have everybody with us. So things are just a little bit different. I We always have a little different format. Usually sometimes I can see folks. This time I can't. So we'll try to do our best to make it feel as if we're having a conversation together. I think that'll be the best. We have our agenda set up in front of us here. Definition, myths, and misconceptions. That'll be some of the information we get into in the beginning. Research and impact. And then effective assessment strategies. And clearly along the way, uh, we'll be having some good conversations. So we should be getting a lot of really good information today. We're going to start off with understanding dyslexia. Some of this might be not new information for you, but for those that maybe this is new information, it might be good to just kind of get a grounding. How long have we known about dyslexia? It's been a while. <laughs> That's the thing is, it has been a while, hasn't it, Kristen? <laughs> yes, it has. Yeah, definitely. And We've known about it a long time. I love this. Uh, 1896. You know, that was a long time ago. <laughs> so uh, yeah, Pringle Morgan, a doctor in England, published the first description of a learning disorder that would come to be known as developmental dyslexia. So even though it's a buzzword now, we have legislation in states and it's becoming a hot topic in recent years. It's not new, right? Yeah, definitely not so new. Surprising that we've had to deal with this kind of, you know, people not knowing, and certainly that was for me and my family, we didn't know and had to do our own journey of discovery. The other thing I think is interesting within this history, I even looked up this uh, W. Pringle Morgan, and there was also some parallel history in Germany around the same time of some other individuals in science that were aware of this thing they were calling word blindness. But what was interesting is they would write from the perspective of what it did to the person. I thought that was really interesting. So it was a very personal account of how devastating it was to be someone who was otherwise bright, having difficulty learning to read and capturing that that long ago. So I think that's interesting. Um, here's the term dyslexia, and we're going to get into the definition because it's important. And in most of the states in the United States, somewhere in legislation is this IDA, this is the International Dyslexia Association, definition of dyslexia. 
And it's important because within the definition are a lot of the characteristics that we're looking for when we talk about, well, I don't know, could I ever spot somebody with dyslexia? I'm not quite sure what that looks like. The definition itself holds a lot of that key. The other thing is that pay attention to whether it says specific learning disability, that's in the definition. Our local in Utah, we adopted this definition, but removed specific learning disability to say disorder because of SPED law, which is kind of interesting. So pay attention to those nuances. It's interesting. But we're talking about it being a specific learning disability that is neurobiological in origin. Right there, that can give folks a grounding in, oh, it's within the brain and it's specific. Okay. It is characterized by, I think this is good to look at, difficulties with accurate and or fluent word recognition or spelling and decoding abilities. So right away, if you are wondering about somebody and you think, wow, that really describes them, I think that's that's a pretty good description. Remember, it says difficulties with accurate or fluent word recognition. Not that they can't recognize, because that's another thing I often hear as a misconception is, well, they read, that just isn't very good. And it's really hard and, and inaccurate. These difficulties typically result from a deficit in the phonological component of language. And we'll get into that a little bit more later, but that's the sounds. And I think we've had a lot more discussion about sounds lately than we have in a long time, which is great. That is often unexpected in relation to other cognitive abilities. So remember, this is unusual. Why am I seeing this? The student's typically in class, looks to be attentive, looks to be trying. Why is this so difficult? And the provisions of an effective classroom instruction. So that's the piece we've really been working on a lot within legislation in our country is improving that effective classroom instruction. Yeah, Secondary absolutely. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, go I ahead. Was, go you ahead, just have me thinking here. Um, I'm from Atlanta, by the way. So yeah, that's where I'm coming to from tonight. But in Atlanta or in Georgia, we have two pieces of legislation. We have dyslexia legislation that we have to be in full compliance with this year, which is great. We're finally screening in Georgia for the first time. Wow. And then we also have a new Senate bill, which means that all of our materials have to also be in alignment with the science and the research. All that being said, we still don't say dyslexia in our schools and in our tier meetings. We say characteristics of, and we're very, very careful to have removed the word dyslexia. We've kind of washed it away from everything we're doing, which is interesting. But we have that dear colleague letter, right? The dear colleague letter that says you can use the word dyslexia. So a lot of the work I'm doing with teachers is saying, yes, you can. You can say this word and use this definition. That's interesting. Gosh, Chris, uh, you know, I really appreciate you telling us and sharing that with us, Kristen, because it will be different in different states. As Kristen said, she's from Georgia. I'm from Utah. You may also be thinking in your head, hey, it looks this way here. I'm aware of ways in which it's different, ways in which it's similar. And then hopefully we're moving as we're all trying talking about this towards a place of a lot more understanding or speaking openly. And these things become commonplace within a school, right? These conversations and discussions, that would be fantastic to see that happen. I was even having dinner with Dr. Nancy Mather. She's co-author of the Woodcock Johnson and author of The Todd. She was in Utah a week ago attending a conference, and we were discussing this very thing here, how important the definition is and an understanding of the definition. And then, as you mentioned, Kristen, getting directly to screening and screening all students to then understand what do I do with what I find. So that's really interesting. Um, look at these secondary consequences in that definition that may include problems in reading comprehension. That should make a lot of sense to us. If the decoding piece is very difficult for me, I'm inaccurate, I'm not terribly fluent, it's obviously gonna impact my comprehension and a reading experience that can impede growth of vocabulary and background knowledge and those sorts of things because I'm just not, I'm not feeling engaged. I'm not gonna remember what I've read, I'm not gonna feel like doing it. So a lot of these things you'll see as the student goes through the school system and gets older, you'll see those secondary consequences as, a, as part of that. So let's take a look at some of these warning signs. We talked about that important definition. So what are warning signs that we see of, of a student who has dyslexia? That first one is a difficulty learning the sounds that letters and letter combination that they make. So we've talked a lot about this lately. Maybe you didn't have training years ago, but uh, most of the country is getting some training in some form, whether it's letters training or something else in which they're learning about these things, that very important letter sound to letter combination. Uh, training that they need in order to teach students. And then problems with basic word decoding, that's sounding out unfamiliar words. So if that sound to symbol correspondence is really shaky for you, 
then you are going to have problems with taking words apart, sounding them out if they're unfamiliar because you're not quite sure how things go together. Slow and labor intensive reading. Of course, that's going to slow it right down, make it labor intensive. I'll be pouring over this, trying my hardest to make it happen. Difficulty spelling is always uh, apparent because if I can't decode it when someone else has provided it, I'm not really going to have a chance to encode it when that's all on me. Now I have to come up with how does this go together? And then avoiding activities that involve reading. Kristen, any thoughts on this list? Yeah, I'm as you're reading off this list, I'm just thinking of how important it is to take action early and not wait to react. When we see these warning signs, we need to take action and not take that wait to fail approach. That wait to see approach really is a wait to fail approach, right? So when we see these warnings, uh, we need to just be really, really proactive. And then that fifth one just hurts my heart a little bit, you know, avoiding activities that involve reading. Um, I was listening to a podcast with Kareem Weaver this morning, and he was saying, you know, we don't have in the secondary space necessarily an attendance problem. We have a literacy problem or we don't have a behavior problem. We have a literacy problem. You know, lots of times these things, avoiding these activities, they get not just avoiding, we're switching them out for problematic behaviors or problematic attendance. And that's that's really hurtful. You know, I have a teenage son and I think luckily he can read and read well, but if he couldn't, he sure would cut up before he let anybody think that he was dumb or, you know, felt dumb. So um, just thinking about these warning signs, I think how important it is for early childhood teachers to know these warning signs and to um, be proactive and reactive accordingly. I think that's great. You know, we get a tip off on that first one too, difficulty learning the sounds that letters and letter combinations make and putting that together, the alphabetic principle, the sound of the symbol. And right there within that area, that's early. That's early in the development, right? So we're talking kindergarten, not too soon. Preschool, I can already pick up on students who are having difficulty hearing the sounds within, you know, multisyllabic words. You want to pick up on some of that. Knowing and understanding a family's history, which is helpful because you know whether or not, oh, there was dyslexia somewhere in the family line. There's a higher prevalence of having dyslexia. So those are things that will feed into your understanding of and catching earlier. As Kristen said, that's that great ground to catch folks earlier and get in there and get involved. So warning signs of dyslexia in teens and adults. So what are some other things that we're going to see as a student ages within the system? So there's difficulty reading, including reading aloud. And as Kristen and I both remarked on, you're going to want to be considered a lot of things before you want to be considered a poor reader or someone who can't read something. And so you may see behaviors that accompany that too. Slow and labor intensive reading and writing. Again, I will have people say to me a lot, oh, well, they can read, so they're not dyslexic. Yeah, they can read, folks with dyslexia read, but watch how they're reading. What's being produced as a result and how hard is it? What's what's the labor involved? And that's included with writing. What does that writing look like? How much effort does it take? Um, so these are things we need to pay attention to. Mispronouncing names or words or problems, retrieving the words. So that was something I was talking about earlier. You can catch that really early with multisyllabic words and the mispronunciation pronunciation. There's a lot of that going on. And spending an unusually long time completing tasks that involve reading and writing. These are students who are taking hours. If you have a parent who comes to talk, talk, talk to you about, hey, we're at this for hours. We're doing homework for hours. And really, as the teacher, you think that's maybe a 20-minute assignment. That's typically maybe a 25-minute assignment. Pay attention to those things because that's giving you another sign. And the problems with spelling, yes, they're just going to be, and their own name, dates, days of the week, months of the year, and they've seen them a lot. They can't get them down because they have a problem with that underlying system. Kristen, what do you think? Yeah, I was just thinking how, you know, most of my experience in time is in a K-5 setting. And so this, I, I'm just thinking about this, how often do secondary teachers or, or tutors working with adults Maybe in the tutoring situation, it's different, but how often do secondary teachers listen to a student read out loud? They can't see that process that's happening internally. And so being really aware of these signs is really important. Yeah, I think that's great. I've got adult students. That's my my place that I work a lot is in the adult space with students who are in the workplace. And all of them have very similar stories that they share where they would time when there was something to be read 
time it to get up and leave the classroom. Somehow I would be, I would make sure I was out of the classroom and it was consistent. And I would oftentimes, they say, have a teacher that would say, Hey, you're not going to need to go to the bathroom again. Are you when we're, and that was a sign because the teacher obviously saw that it was reoccurring, just didn't put it together with the fact that it was always over reading. So those are things to pay attention to and look for. The other or thing is another didn't. student. So yeah, sorry, no. don't know. I'm just, my brain is just going and I, I learn so much every time I listen to you that my brain just <laughs> wants to go. But I'm just thinking too, um, or the teacher may not know what to do. Yeah. A teacher working with teens and adults has not had that same training that maybe a primary grade teacher has had. So maybe they don't notice that it's about reading or they don't know what to do about it. Yeah. And you know, that's the thing, Kristen, is until you start to notice and then you say, okay, I've noticed now, what do I do? So it's maybe a process too. So be patient with yourself. Maybe first step is noticing, taking, now that I have some things to look for, I'm going to be more aware. Now I've noticed, where do I go? So it can be a step process. And most of the states have a dyslexia handbook that we're, we're talking about. A lot of these things are within a state handbook and they should also address what you can do with older students too, to help them. Because remember with child find, it's every student, doesn't matter how old they are. We're still obligated when you see a student who has challenges with learning and it hasn't been addressed, we do it, right? That's just our mandate, whether it's eighth grade, 12th grade, seventh grade. But a lot of these adults would also talk about the fact that they would make their name always in initials because they, some of them had tricky spellings for their name. And they said, half the time I get it right, half the time I would get it wrong. And so I put my initials and the teacher would always be very upset. Why are you writing initials? So that's another sign. Of course, the student said, I was never going to say, hey, I'm not sure I'm going to spell my own name right. <laughs> so they're not going to tell you right off why they're doing it. It's another thing. The prevalence of dyslexia. Why is that important? Because teachers are going to have students with dyslexia in their classrooms. That's just the way the numbers are. About 20% of the general population, and remember, you can hear pushback on this figure, and that's because of cut figures, cut numbers, where we're going to cut things off, but that doesn't mean that the kid just over the cut point may not need help. That's a thing to remember, too. Um, somewhere there had to be a cut point, but we're saying about 20% of the population has dyslexia. One in five in a classroom is how that break breaks down as well, or you can look at it as 20% who may have challenges with reading, if you want to call it that or look at it that way. They're going to be everywhere in every classroom. And then let's remember that 90% of those with learning disabilities, it's something to do with reading. So that's that's big, huge. And we know that from looking at our special, special education numbers as well. It's interesting to me to think that what we need to be doing in tier one is what we also need to be doing for students with dyslexia. So, uh, you know, according to NAEP data, there's about 34% of fourth graders that are reading on or above grade level, which means, thank you, which mm -hmm. means that 33%, which means that, you know, 66%, 67% are not reading on or above grade level. So we have a dyslexia issue, but we also have a literacy crisis. But the, what's it promising to me is what we need to do for students with dyslexia is also what we need to do to bring the other students around. So, um, you know, it's promising to me to think about that. And then, as you said, most students who have dyslexia or struggles with reading, it's it's a phonological processing deficit usually. So if we can make people aware of that and how to address that, it'll make a big difference. Yeah, and this is interesting. I like to think about the NAEP data and I didn't know this until we were doing this, that female students dropped between the last two reporting periods. So fourth graders dropped in general and female students dropped. We think about how boys get, you know, boys as struggling readers. So this was an interesting statistic to me. Yeah, right. That's something to keep our eye on because we typically think, as you said, Kristen, as the female students, oh, they're going to do a little bit better than typically males within this literacy space. <sighs> Not so much. We need to keep an eye on that. And I wonder about that too. Is it because they're quiet and compliant and sometimes they fly under the radar? Maybe. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, and that. we think also about that fourth grade number. We think about that fourth grade slump. We've all heard that term, the fourth grade slump. That's the time when picture support is taken away and a lot of support is taken away. And then those really bright students that struggle, suddenly they're, they're seen right, where they've been flying under the radar for kindergarten, first, second, third grade, because they are bright and they have the context. 
and they have background knowledge, vocabulary. But then suddenly when all of that picture support and some of that other support comes away, then we hit that fourth grade slump. And we always wonder, like, it's a mystery, this fourth grade slump. It's not so much a mystery <laughs> when we see what the deficits are and what's missing. Yeah. And Kristen, I think it's interesting when you work with older students in that older space, another thing that we used to look to was the ACT or SAT, whichever one or both that you take in a state for college entrance exam, that oftentimes I would have students, that's how I would finally get a lot of students in that secondary space is they would take that first ACT test and have a score of 15 when they had a 4.0. I've even had a student mm. who was on the, the scholar list at their high school and they got mm. a 15 and the parents are outraged. Like what's, what's going on. And then when you do an assessment, do a little look underneath it's dyslexia and they've been flying under the radar because they're bright kids. Everybody liked them very sociable. They were leaning on other skills to get by. And that's a reading test for the ACT. Yeah. That makes me think too, talking about flying under the radar and getting by the, um, if you haven't seen it, you should watch it. I know you can get it on Amazon Prime and some other places, but the truth about reading, yeah. remember Donnell, in the truth about reading, the high school teacher taught for 17 years, he was a high school teacher who could not read or write. So people do, as surprising it is, as it is, they do absolutely just fly under the radar. Um, fantastic movie, by the way, very inspiring and Highly recommend. <laughs> yeah, you're right. That was a really good movie. And that flying under the radar piece is so interesting. We accept, this is the thing about it is, is socially we accept the fact that I'm not a good speller. How many times have you heard somebody say that? And it's just accepted. Oh, I'm just, I'm not really good at that. Or I'm not a really great reader. And we need to stop accepting those things to say, what had we not done that we could have done in order to help that person become a reader? So we know that we can. Statistically, we know it's possible and that there will be a few that will still struggle. That's where we get that 95% from is how many folks that if we really taught with the science of reading, what we know to be the, the correct way to teach, the right way to teach, that we'd be able to reach those students. The other thing I, I want to say here, too, that's important is, and it was mentioned by Dr. Louisa Motes and Margie Gillis at a, a thing that I attended just a couple of weeks ago here in my state, and they both reminded folks, it takes a long time to turn this. So in other words, if you're expecting results in a state because, oh, this year we did a lot of new things, that's that's not fair. So it takes at least five years when you when you're changing things to start to see a difference. So remember that when folks are putting a lot of pressure on, on data, when you've made a change. And I say something about that too. I, yeah. we have a slide that we show in, in my job and I can't give you the source off the top. I apologize, but it says that if you can get 80% uh, of the people on board for a change, it can happen in three years. Uh. And if you only get around 20 something percent, it could take 17 years to see yeah. a change happen. So I really want everybody to be on board and, you know, talking about the pressure and to, just before we get on to this, um, I always tell teachers when I'm training, I say, you know, if we were on a field trip and I had my 30 little kiddos behind me, they're just following me. We're walking to the museum and two thirds of them fall off into a ditch. We're going to stop, right? That's my next move. I'm going to call 911. I'm going to make a human chain. I'm going to call for help. I'm going to do something. But with reading and literacy, we've let two thirds of the kids kind of fall off and we just keep going toward the field trip. We've just gone on with business as usual. And I say that even though I'm talking about a tier one national literacy crisis, still the structured literacy, what we need to do to reach those kids is what we need to do to reach kiddos with dyslexia. So you talked about not accepting, saying we have a reading problem. It makes me think also that we can't accept business as usual. All the changes that are sweeping around, thanks to parent advocacy groups and social media and all of this, it's such good change. And yes, there's chaos before a great change, right? Chaos always precedes great change. We feel like we're in chaos in Georgia right now, <laughs> but great change is happening. Yeah, well, that's great. Thank you for reminding us of that. And here on this slide, this is probably a good place to have this slide. What is my state doing about dyslexia? So there's a website, this improvingliteracy.org, and you can get on it, click on your state, and it is pretty up to date. I checked out Utah, and they're pretty accurate right there. It'll tell you whether your state has a handbook about dyslexia. It'll tell you what legislation um, you have with dyslexia in your state. So I think it's always nice to check up, and that, like I say, they do a good job of keeping current on that. So if you don't know, you can find out some basic information there and then continue your journey in learning. And Kristen, myths and misconceptions, why don't you take us here? 
All right. So if you want to go on to the first one, yeah, there we go. Dyslexia is a sign of low intelligence. Absolutely not. <laughs> it is not related to cognitive abilities or intelligence at all. So a matter of fact, when we're doing a screener or we're trying to take a full, you know, a comprehensive look at a student, we, um, we're looking for struggles in reading that are not expected based on intelligence. Um, so definitely not a sign of intelligence. So and absolutely Kristen not. Mm -hmm. One here, I'll just quickly add, because this is, sure. boy, this one speaks to my heart. This was my husband, who as an adult, we finally got, what is this, dyslexia in his 40s. We finally had the right answer. This is after having four children, desperate to get information because two of the four have dyslexia as well. And we finally land on it. We have a term. And my husband said, finally, there's a name. I can call it dyslexia instead of stupid because I felt like my IQ was in question, my intelligence was in question my entire life. That is not something we want our students ever to feel and certainly not for a lifetime. So this is really important. Thank you, Kristen. Yeah, and you know, we I hear both sides when I people are talking about, you know, not labeling a child, but it you name it to tame it, right? Yeah. When you have the name, then you, like you said with your story, you can tame it and feel like, okay, there's a reason. Dyslexia is just about reversing letters. Another uh, false myth, right? <laughs> um, students will reverse letters naturally till about age six. That's, you know, normal development. Beyond that, it is a sign of, you know, a lag in reading achievement, but not necessarily dyslexia because it's not um, a visual issue right? Um, it's a neurobiological issue as we see in the definition. So yes, there's a visual component, uh, our optic nerves involved, right? We take in a word by sight. So there's a visual element to reading, but we store words in the back here. We store words back here as a linguistic representation. So, you know, heaven forbid something happens and I get damaged right here and I can't read anymore, but I can still tell that this is a lamp, that this is a desk, that that's a door. I can still recognize objects, but I can't read anymore because we don't store them visually the way that we store objects. So, um, when I think about reversing letters, I think about a visual issue. So reversing letters can be a sign that there's a lag in reading development, but it doesn't mean dyslexia necessarily. Am I saying that right, Donnell? I mean, am I explaining that clearly? Yes. And in fact, oftentimes we, because we weren't along for the whole journey of that student, what we didn't realize is how much uh, they weren't getting an opportunity to make correct associations, right? And to form and to form letters correctly. So that's another thing oftentimes with adult folks who have dyslexia that I work with, we do as much letter formation work as we do of a lot of things because I'll find they're starting in the middle, bottom. They never really knew how to form those letters. They were just hanging on for dear life. And the lowercase letters do resemble. They have and there's directionality challenges for folks who have dyslexia, left, right, up, down, back, front, even how long something takes, because there's also a piece of ADHD that can be impacting for folks with dyslexia. Dyslexia. So that can complicate things quite a bit when you get into those letter formations, particularly those lowercase letters that are all quite similar. And so that's why we pay attention to letter formation a lot with our students who have dyslexia too, getting the sound to the letter to the formation down, doing a lot of practice to make sure that they have mastery. So yeah, I appreciate everything you said there. Yeah. You said the other things that bring more to mind. <laughs> <laughs> So our brains a long time ago were, are, are, were wired to ignore the way something was flipped or turned, right? Long mm -hmm. time ago, we needed to know if there was a bear facing us this way or this way or whatever way, we needed to know that. So our brain is kind of hardwired to ignore reversals. So we are when we are teaching and making the synaptic connections, now we're going to know how to discern those. But like you said, it's lagging behind. And I'm wondering if the new emphasis or renewed emphasis on handwriting will help yeah. that a little bit, right? Because when students are fluent at making those letters, that also frees up some cognitive space there, right? Yep. Um, yeah, so that's, I think that's interesting. All right, myth number three is dyslexia can be outgrown. It can't, <laughs> <laughs> obviously. If only. <laughs> Right. If only it could. Now, that doesn't mean that we can't remediate. Right. And we can't intervene and intervene early. We've all seen the X and Y axis where the gap is just growing over the years. So, um, you know, we, we can still intervene and hopefully intervene early, but it can't be outgrown. Students learn to cope. We can learn to accommodate. We can intervene early, but it cannot be outgrown. 
Yeah. And something to remember about that too, especially that older space, the one that I'm very familiar with, is that re reading remediation, a lot, some of the students that I do work with, oftentimes they did receive quite a bit when they were younger, but the idea was it was only reading that would be impacted for the person who has dyslexia. But there are other aspects, like I said, directionality oftentimes, and those other things weren't paid attention to. So when they entered spaces where there is a sort of figuring it out, there's a literacy to it component. So driver's education for one, lots of new things, new symbols, new, and there wasn't the, the understanding of how to explicitly teach a lot of those spaces. So they felt very intimidating to my students. So that's something to pay attention to as well for the older student. Yeah. And you also said that, um, you know, ADHD, lots of times yeah, dyslexia cool is time. comorbid. It's comorbid with other things. Lots of times there may be dysgraphia or dyscalculia or ADHD. Um, yeah. So that's important to know too, that it, sometimes they're not just battling one thing or trying to yeah. overcome one thing. Yeah. And then the research. Yeah, this is a long one. So there's a lot, a lot of research, which is exciting because it's a really important topic, right? Uh, this impacts life trajectories. And I don't think it's overstating it to say that. It really impacts life trajectories if we can change this. Um, for example, in Georgia, I'm so excited that we're finally screening in kindergarten, finally, um, because it's part of the onboarding process in the federal prison system to screen for reading difficulties. So I'm like, wow, how did we have that so backwards? And we're finally, you know, flipping it on its head. So I'm excited that the research is there and it's being brought to the forefront. Um, with the research, we know that it has a neurological basis, that dyslexia is a neurological basis, Right. Um, that it's phonological processing, brain differences. We have evolutionary perspectives so that some research suggests dyslexia may have an evolutionary basis with individuals showing enhanced abilities in areas such as discovery, invention, and creativity, which is exciting. We have a lot of uh, people that have dyslexia that are very creative. They're entrepreneurs. They are, you know, it has, like we said, nothing to do with intelligence. Um, and then there's a lot of research on effective interventions. We know that structured literacy is the method for teaching reading for all students, but it's absolutely critical to students with dyslexia. It needs to be multisensory, have phonemic awareness training. We said that phonological processing is usually the issue with dyslexia. Um, and so there's a lot of research. I mean, you could just be inundated with the research, but the main thing to know is that it's neurobiological. There's an issue in phonological processing. It really is brain differences. We know too, right, Donnell, that our brain is not hardwired to read and write. Our brain is hardwired for language, right? That's why if you have a toddler and they're surrounded by language, eventually they'll start talking. But if we put a person um, just around a bunch of books, they're not going to start reading or writing. And so through your instruction, if you're an educator, through your instruction, you're physically changing the brain. You are like a brain architect making things happen. And so there are brain differences, but we can make a difference through our instruction. And that research, Kristen, that you're talking about, I'm so grateful to folks who have dyslexia. I call them those canary in the coal mine that were alerting us to a problem. So a lot of the information that we have about really good reading instruction comes from people who were struggling with reading, right? They get, That's where we got a lot of our good information. And so how does dyslexia affect reading, writing, and comprehension? Well, like Kristen, you were saying, you know, about best practices now that we know about the, the foundational skills that we need, but it affects everything to do with reading, writing, and comprehension. As you mentioned, oral language, that's the thing we we're wired to do, right? That's, that's something that we pick up. Where if there's a challenge with hearing or something like that, or speech, that you're going to have a challenge with that, we need to intervene. But otherwise, you're going to pick it up wherever I plant you down, you're going to pick up the language that you're exposed to. And that we can pick up storytelling, you know, we can engage in a story, converse, but then Going to reading, where now you have a code that's man-made, that's fairly new when you think about it, and a code that has you know some rules that are consistent, others that don't seem so much. We've adopted some words from other languages over time, and there's a hi whole history as to why the language appears the way that it does. But what it amounts to is that sometimes that code can be rather difficult. So if I have an issue with putting the sound to the symbol, which is the heart of dyslexia, then that's going to be very, very difficult for me. Likewise, when you think about the writing piece of it, now it's up to me. Uh, this is expressive. This is encoding. I've got to come up with 
not only all of the words to say, but how to spell them correctly, how to organize them within the sentence. Well, that's a lot for me to do. And then the comprehension piece is impacted. Both the reading and the writing are both impacted by comprehension because, as you know, if I'm spending all of my time trying to figure out what it's saying for the decoding, I'm not spending a lot of time freed up thinking about what the characters are doing or maybe the information that I'm being given in this passage. Likewise, with writing, I'm not going to be freed up to be able to think about what is it I really want to tell someone about this. If I'm thinking about, can I spell that? I don't even know if I can spell that. So that's how does it affect reading, writing, and comprehension? And then, Kristen, how about what are the emotional and psychological impacts on the student? Yeah, right. We're, we don't live in a separate bubble. Our academic and our uh, social emotional learning is, is not separated, right? And so obviously the students can have low self-esteem from struggling with reading and writing, just like we talked to. They'll sometimes um, adapt those avoiding um, or compensating by avoiding strategies. Frustration, anxiety from the repeated failure, feeling like you can't do what other people can do. Depression, right? Persistent academic struggles are linked to depression. And then, of course, behavioral issues we've talked about, social withdrawal can happen, right? Just think about, you know, the, the young people in your life and how they just want to fit in. They just want to succeed. They just want to please. And when none of that happens or it's hard to happen, uh, yeah, you just you're going to have low self-esteem, depression, um, increased emotional reactivity, right? Reacting to things in an um, overly dramatic way. And then, of course, there's the long term effects, right? Emotional and psychological challenge can have long-term impacts on education, social economic outcomes, right? Not just an impact on that person's social emotional um, life. It impacts all the people in their circle and their community, and it just really has far-reaching impact. And Kristen, I don't think there's any better uh, story for this or illustration than a student of mine that I have. He's in his 60s, very successful. He's been financially very successful. And we've been working together for years now. And now he comes so we can read some higher level reads because he's done a lot of intervention work. And now we're doing Sherlock Holmes, things he never got to read when he was younger that he just loves to read and then discuss. But one of the things he said to me is, in the years of coming to see you, I have finally felt okay enough about having dyslexia that a friend that I've had since I was in kindergarten, now mind you, because the emotional piece, he was always very high intelligence with emotional, very connected to people. And he said, a friend that I've had since kindergarten I finally told him the other day, I have dyslexia. And it took him that long to be okay to tell a friend from kindergarten that's had his back all through these years, I have dyslexia. Yeah. And his friend's response was, why didn't you tell me? Why did you tell me this before? Which I thought was really interesting. But he says, it's taken me that long to be okay with it. So this emotional and psychological impacts of dyslexia, of being that person who didn't quite get it with reading and writing, you, you don't realize how deep that can be and lifelong for somebody. So that's why intervening early so important, supporting all the way along, so important. Those research findings you were mentioning for us, Kristen, you were talking about the advances in understanding the neurological basis of dyslexia. You talking about where we store the words, the sound system, the networks, that science that's now readily available to everyone. It used to be that that's only what was only available if you sought out those individuals within a field. I remember telling people years ago when my son, my last child who has just a, a good case of all the Ds, dyslexia, dyscraphia, and everything, <laughs> and we weren't getting anywhere in the school system. I thought, I have got to figure this out. I remember going to the library library and because that's where you used to go folks do you remember libraries <laughs> those are in the olden days I'm <laughs> aging myself here as I speak but went to the library and stumbled across the book Overcoming Dyslexia by Dr. Sally Shaywitz from the Yale Center for Dyslexia and Creativity you know now of course she's everywhere everybody knows about her but that was new to me and stumbled across that book got not so far as over the steps of the library out to my car and I sat out there and read it till that parking lot was empty and I finished the book because for the first time I had access to the research, but that's where I had, it was in a book. Thankfully today, folks, it's everywhere. You can sign up for a webinar and get to see it. And we do know because we now have these advances in being able to see fMRI scans to be able to see what's happening in the brain. So that's new and different in terms of, oh, are you sure this isn't a pendulum swing we're going to go back to? No, because we see it. We can see it. And now everybody can see it. And then those effective intervention teaching strategies, Kristen, that you were talking about, we know how to teach because of it, right? Yeah, I, I just think it's so exciting that what we've learned from MRIs, you know, and um, the the other one, I can't remember, there's some kind of um, 
dye thing that they can do now, but it's so fascinating that medicine and education and other scientific fields have come together to inform how reading and instruction should happen. Um, I, lots of times when I'm working with the schools, I'm talking to the teachers about the term science of reading. So just to kind of go there for just a second, science of reading is just the term for the collective body of research that's more than five decades. So science of reading is not new. It's not a curriculum. It's not a pendulum swing, as Donnell said, right? I started teaching in 1997, so I've been around for some of those swings, but it's not that. Research can't be a pendulum swing. It is research. It's evidence. So I think that's just really important. And it's also interesting, too, to think about the genetic component, there is um, lots of times a genetic component. Genetic studies have identified several genes linked to dyslexia. So that's why when we're doing that evaluation, we take in that uh, family history as well, which is interesting. Yep. Oh, structured literacy. Love, love, love structured literacy. One of my favorite topics. <laughs> um, so structured literacy, these are the uh, elements of structured literacy, but we also have to think about the principles of structured literacy, right? The diagnostic, explicit, systematic, cumulative, being very, very intentional with our instruction, and then just making sure that these things happen. You know, when we think about comprehension, we think about it as an outcome, right? We're putting these things in the batter, in the bowl, and comprehension is the cake that we get out, right? So if we're giving syllable instruction, sound symbol association, working on phonology, morphology, you know, morpheme is the smallest unit of meaning in a word, syntax, how a sentence is arranged, that's really important in writing too, right? We need to make sure that we're writing at the word level, sentence level, single paragraph level. Everything with structured literacy is building from a more simple ask to a more complex, and then semantics, which is the meaning. So structured literacy, absolutely dire for our struggling readers, but what should be happening for everyone? Yeah, it just makes sense, doesn't it? And I like that we're in a wheel because a lot of these share, right? We, we don't teach them in isolation. So that's another reason why I thought the wheel was nice to see and see all of it together, because oftentimes I might hear a teacher say, oh, so when will I do this instruction here? And then when might I talk about, but when we when we really put it all together. So obviously we're going to do some, some time with those basics that we needed, the alphabetic principle to make sure our students get those down. But then as soon as we can, we're, we're making connections for students with this. So I like that. You, right. Yeah, I love that. And I'm looking at this wheel and I'm saying, don't think of this as one of those sectioned toddler plates, right, where the peas can't touch the chicken nuggets. Right. <laughs> think of it more like a watercolor palette where they're all bleeding together. And like you said, oral language would be right at the center of that oral language at the center of everything and all of these bleeding together. I love this visual. Thank you for that, Donnell. Yeah, you bet. And then in addition, I want us to think about the next step that I see a lot of us talking about now that we're kind of feeling comfortable with a lot of these elements of teaching reading is writing and making sure that we're introducing the principles of writing as early as possible and doing it side by side with a lot of this instruction. So when I talked about those students who have dyslexia, that we're going back over letter formation. I mean, that's important to introduce as quickly as we can with the sound and the symbol, and then having the students form their own symbol as early as they can get that understanding. And a lot of this is, as you see, as you put it together in the principles, then as the students have more time with all of it blended together, that's when we really get to that mastery level where students feel very confident, and very competent handling a piece of text that might have deep, uh, you know, elements within it. And then writing about that. And it's not such a big ask for students because they've been working with these principles all the way along. Likewise, when we have students doing that and developing them together, we can see where the challenges are sooner and then intervene on those challenges and help our students with them. So I think that's important. Kristen, this has been such a fun conversation. <laughs> <laughs> it's an important topic, right? It really is an important topic. And, and you know, what the unfortunate thing is, Kristen, I can't really see everybody because I know we'd, we'd love to be able to interact <laughs> with you. We know this is important for a lot of folks, too, because we, you know, we have conversations all the time. We share, you know, with colleagues and whatnot, people in your neighborhood, folks who reach out to you for help and assistance. It's a very important topic. There are a lot of people who could use this information. And so we're so grateful that everybody took the time to join us today and be part of this. And yep. our assessments. So, 
Yes, we're going to blow through these couple of slides really quickly. I know we want to respect your time, but just identifying dyslexia is is very important, right? Ordinary readers use a certain part of the brain and then uh, poor readers don't. And we can't see this, right? We don't all have these machines in our classroom. And so it's good to know what's happening in the brain, but we also have to see how that plays out in the classroom. And then as Kristen said, those key indicators and early warnings, formal assessment tools. Thankfully in your state, you have screening and screening for everyone. I talked about meeting with Dr. Nancy Mather and talking about the TOD, which is tests of dyslexia that she worked on. I love Dr. Nancy Mather when you're saying, what led you to come up with this test? And she said, well, because people apparently weren't getting it from other tests. And so we said, why not call it tests of dyslexia? So we know, <laughs> I thought that was so good. She's very straightforward. And Kristen here with effective assessment practices, universal screening, efficient and inexpensive tools that, need, that teachers can do within a classroom, multiple measures, so you need to see those things, a comprehensive case history, Kristen talking about oftentimes there's a family history, um, how standardized tests fit within all of this, but making sure that you understand what's available where you are, because as Kristen talked about, what's available in her state may not be available to you. In my state, I know it's quite different, and there are assessment pieces that are available, understanding what they are from the folks at your school, and making sure that all of you have use of them, understand who to go to when you when you use them, and what your next steps are is important for you. Yeah, and before we recap, I would just like to say with assessment, it can seem overwhelming and yeah. official and whatever. You just need to see how your students are reading or writing and whether you have access to universal screening or whether you have access to uh, the test that Donnell is talking about. You need to be, you know, have some kind of screener that you do, whether it's a past assessment, a phonemic awareness assessment, or a core phonics survey. It doesn't have to be formal assessment, but knowing where your students are and then acting, regardless of formal assessment, just don't let formal assessment be, you know, something that's a roadblock for you to informally assess and work with your students where they are. I just wanted to make that point. Kristen, that's a great point. And I think in secondary, that was always the question I would ask a teacher when a teacher would come to me as I was the lead over language and said, they would say, I think a student is struggling. I would say, what does it sound like when they read? And they would say, let me get back to you. Because <laughs> they had quite, had to listen to suit, but I said, right. do that because you'll find out a lot and then come tell me right. what you find out. Yeah, right. it's a great way to do it. And our recap, just thank you so much for joining us today. That was quick though, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> quick. And then I think yeah, Jillian's so we, yeah, yeah, Jillian's going to come back on, but we covered definitions, myths, misconceptions, research and impact, and effective assessment strategies. And again, you don't have to be too formal. Just know what your students need. Yeah. Thank you for your time. Thank you both so much. This was just an honor um, listening to you, learning from you. As a dyslexic myself, I just felt so lifted seen today. And I just appreciate the work that you two are doing and to the participants that are here today, taking the time to learn about this. It's just so inspiring. Um, if you want to go to the next slide, that would be great uh, because we do learn in community and that is how we strengthen our own practice. So I want to come on and just invite everybody here to continue our learning and our conversation with our uh, dyslexia awareness challenge. So you can use the QR code um, that you see here, and I'll actually put the link in the chat as well. But what this is, is a space within the Science of Reading Collective, which is a curriculum neutral community where educators can come and collaborate and share best practices and engage in meaningful discussion about foundational literacy. So in that space, we have this dyslexia awareness challenge in here. Um, the link will take you right to the feed and, I, and you can share one thing you've learned, something that you hope that you learn in part two, maybe a question that you have. And then comment on one other person's post. So at the end of these two webinars, these two series, the and 
with the two challenges, you will earn your very own dyslexia awareness badge for you to display in the Science of Reading Collective. So if you're not a part of this community yet, we invite you to join. It's awesome. There's so much exciting stuff happening and we're looking forward to continuing the conversation there. All right, I will turn it back to you, Donnell, to kind of wrap us up. I know we're at time. I don't know if you have time for a couple of questions or whatnot. So Jillian, we'll do whatever. We, we Yes, Kristen and I would love to keep talking if you want us to. <laughs> okay, so if you have to hop off, no worries. If you want to stay on, great. Like I said, the recording will be available for you. So you can always come back and see what you miss if you do have to hop off. Do you want me to just read to you some of the questions that came in in the Q&A? Yeah, give us a couple. We'll see what we can do. All right, awesome. So here's one that I thought was interesting. It was, my student struggles with reading, yet she can explain what the story is about. Is this something that is common with dyslexia? Yes. <laughs> Short answer, yes. And in fact, that's a student I would right away be very interested in because that sounds a lot like my youngest. Boy, could he tell you a whale of a story. He was so good with oral language and then struggled to read, just struggled to read. And that was the big uh, deficit for him. So that student sounds very interesting to me. How about you, Kristen? Yeah, it makes me think of those four struggling reader profiles, you know, yep. the four quadrants where they may have great language comprehension and have a great background knowledge and a vocabulary and can compensate really well, but then they can't decode. Yeah. yeah. So it's if you haven't seen that quadrant of the four struggling profiles, that would be interesting to look at. Very cool. Thank you. Here is your next question. Do you think allowing students to use speech to text is helpful? Or is it a hindrance to students with dyslexia? And how old are they talking here? Do you know, Jillian, so we can target I, it for them? I okay. don't know. If they are still on, they could type it quick in the Q&A. Um, but yeah, we could make okay. it even more specific for them. But Kristen, go ahead. I answered the first one first. And <laughs> I, well, my first thought was it's inevitable <laughs> whether we, you know, want it or not. I, <laughs> I use it all the time. Um, I think anytime we accommodate, you know, and we, we make, can make them successful, it does, it's not necessarily a problem as long as it's not a constant crutch, right? As long as it's not replacing that good instruction. So if, especially if we're talking about a student that can't decode or spell, that instruction still has to happen, but maybe that's helping them in other areas, right? Maybe that's helping them get through with some other things or, or feel successful in, in writing, right? Where they need, where the focus should be on the content. I think it's okay as long as it's not replacing quality instruction. Right. It's not just like, you know, use this. I can't deal with that. <laughs> you know, just yeah. use this. Right. Not in place of finding a solution or working toward a solution. Yeah. yeah, I would I would agree with Kristen. And a lot of times this is an age or a grade in which people want to talk about. So when can I introduce? When is it OK? And again, mm -hmm. it's back to instruction. So even if a student has made it into sixth grade and is still struggling with because they didn't receive the, the correct instruction, you want to intervene, like Kristen said, to make sure they get correct letter formation opportunity. Those are really important pathways in which we want to reinforce. But then when it comes to getting my classwork and assignments done, that's an accommodation that I should be able to use. So that my responses to things can be rich and can also indicate everything that I know and understand. So I don't feel like I'm being held behind for that or being docked in any way, but at the same time, getting the, the important instruction that I need. My son fit this very well because he could tell, like I told you, a story like you wouldn't believe. Boy, was that kid a storyteller. To, and today he calls himself an author, which I'm so pleased about. Boy, was that a lot of work. But we ran this delicate space of making sure that he was still getting correct letter formation to make those pathways so he could still be able to do that. And it was very important. We know that those pathways are important. The doc of uh, the work of uh, Dr. Berninger is very important there. She tells us a lot about how that works. Um, but also he wanted we wanted to give him the opportunity to be able to tell his story. So he felt like he was really expressing himself. And as the teacher, you'll know that space for your student, but make sure they're getting that good, rich instruction, like Kristen said. Yeah, I was thinking about that. You know, let's say a student broke their leg. We're going to give them some crutches to walk on, but we're still going to do the physical therapy, 
right? We're going to let them be successful, but still do the underlying work. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, this one just came in. It says, what do you suggest for an older self-conscious dis for older self-conscious dyslexics who do not want to read out loud? 14 year old boy. What is the importance of spell? Okay, so it's a kind of a double question, but also what is the importance of spelling correctly if the student is writing expressively and willingly? My son, 14, is greatly discouraged when I correct his spelling. Okay, wow. Okay, first off, I want to give both of you a hug. <laughs> because this is so hard and it just speaks to my space. And so I'm sending you lots of strength and know that you are seen and heard and understood. There are people who totally get it and there's a community of folks and you can meet them through decoding dyslexia if you don't have, haven't met that group yet in your state, but make sure you find other folks who are who can just totally know what you're talking about because it sounds like you need some, some folks around you that get it. Um, the piece is you never make somebody read out loud that struggles with reading um, that they shouldn't have to do that. Receiving intervention in a private setting so that I can pick up skills, we still want to do that. 14 years old, there's still so much room and, and work we can do, but make sure we have a good intervention that's directly meant for the student and it's targeted and it's um, they've been assessed so that they're getting the right instruction for them. And then also with that spelling piece, we still want to work on spelling in terms of giving them phonemic awareness and enough to be able to get close enough approximation to spelling that even if they use spell check, they can get to it. Because a lot of my older students didn't receive even enough intervention to get close enough on a spell check. The other thing is, whenever they're willing to write, we never correct the spelling within that writing, but we'll do it in intervention. So we separate those two out. In intervention, I'm instructing on that spelling. When you're writing, you're writing. Be creative, do everything you can. And that's why that intervention piece is still really good space is because that's where I can still be talking about and intervening on spelling, but I can still give you all the support and space you need to be creative when you're writing and support your writing. But we still need to intervene to make sure we're getting close enough to those skills. Anyway, Kristen, you probably got a lot of good ideas too. Well, I mean, I absolutely agree with that. Um, especially in the school setting, they shouldn't be asked to read out loud right? No. Everybody should be triggered by thinking of that old popcorn reading practice. <laughs> that was so terrible, right? Terrible. And so they shouldn't be asked to do that. Maybe at home with you, he can read out loud if, you know, if he, if you, if you need to hear that or, or with a tutor. Um, but yeah, I totally agree. During writing, we want them just to express and their content is what matters, right? And then later separating out that time to work on spelling. That way that they're not just so discouraged and feel like everything is wrong with my writing. Why should I even write, right? We just want to not have that happen. Yep. Awesome. Okay. I'm going to give you one more. And that is uh, my son's school has said that he's getting better with interventions. So no more dyslexia text testing is needed. Should I seek out a clinic for more testing? I want him to know and understand himself if he does have dyslexia. Say that last part again, Jillian. It kind of froze for a second. Oh, yeah. Uh, last sentence was, I want him to know and understand himself if he does have dyslexia. Mm. It's interesting because... <laughs> When we're trying to find out if there is a, a, a diagnosis, right? One of the things we have to rule out is, did they have the right kind of instruction before? And so it's hard to know. Um, I mean, you absolutely, you can follow through and get additional testing. But I, I think about those rule out factors. And so thankful that he's, that he's doing better, right? But I would really want to know that he's doing better consistently for a long time and with what instruction, right? Because there is a there is a chance, right? That if a lack of instruction was happening or there was some other factor that was impeding, it doesn't mean your son has dyslexia or doesn't have dyslexia. Thank goodness he's improving, but I would want to know that that's consistent and sustainable. Um, and by all means, you can get other testing. I don't know about your state. In Georgia, we have direct parent referrals where the school doesn't have to give you you can tell the school, test my child for free. And they have 60 days to do it. 
Um, so if you really feel strongly that there is an issue, you can push, uh, at least in Georgia, I don't know if that's national or not, but at least in Georgia, you can push and absolutely require the parent to, or the school to assess your child through direct parent referral. And if you have the option to do outside testing, I mean, I always feel like the most information is great, right? But there is a chance that it's uh, instruction as well. Donnell, what do you think about that? Yeah, boy, this is such tricky space. And you could have a conversation all night about this and all the challenges for folks who have dyslexia and the testing. So what about the testing? So again, as Kristen mentioned, state to state differs about what's available and who can determine certain things about dyslexia. So in my state, schools are not allowed to diagnose dyslexia, but you can be identified in a category. It's usually specific learning disability and receive services in a school. And whether or not that school is up to date on, I can say the word dyslexia is whether or not you're going to hear the word, like Kristen was saying, some schools feel like, oh, can I say that? And so you may be left in this kind of limbo saying, so do, does my student have dyslexia? And that's where I was left with my son is he was identified first, picked up and went over to school. Like you're suggesting, I went over and I said, oh gosh, look, this is a, this is a problem. We're first grade. We have all these issues. You've seen me. I've worked with my other kids. This is different. I need some help. We got identified. It was SLD. But then every time I went to say, so is this dyslexia? I would get a, oh, I, you know, I don't, well, I don't know. And that was so unclear. But there were other aspects of what was going on for my son in learning environments that are very, very specific to dyslexia that would have been helpful to know. So I sought additional testing just because I wasn't getting enough information in my setting for what we needed to know. And that was, there were other additional challenges that were directly related to dyslexia. It was very helpful to know. So again, Kristen mentioned something very important too is, well, if your son's making progress, um, but make sure it's steady and consistent and continues. So remember, just holding your ground isn't making progress. So if next year he's still just treading, barely treading, that's not making progress. So Kristen makes a very good point. When we say they're making progress, is it steady and continuous? Are they continuing to make it to that next level? Are they going on? Are they still interested in reading, writing? And hey, those are very important things because then I would start to question, did we really figure that out? And did we receive the right and appropriate intervention? for as long as we needed it? Those are good questions. Yeah. So I and I, I had a want, good answer. Yeah. I'd want to know what the measure was as well. Like yeah. what, what, what data collection tool is, is being used? I mean, it's so complicated. <laughs> it is. <laughs> it is. <laughs> long story short, we're glad he's making progress. And if you want more information, either push a little on the school or go outside if you want. Cause I know as, as a mom, I would probably keep seeking out information just for just, you know, knowledge is power. Yeah. Thank you both. And there are so many other good questions okay. in the Q and a right now. So just another quick reminder to please join us in the Science of Reading Collective in the Dyslexia Awareness Challenge. The QR code is right there for you. Um, and yeah, hop in there. We can, can, can continue the conversation in there. You can share your questions, share something you learned today, and build community around this very important topic. We are already at the top of the hour and a little bit past actually. So we have to wrap it up, but um, thank you again, Donnell and Kristen so much for all this really good information today. And again, for all of our participants for being here. Thank you. All right. Thank you. We'll see you soon.